sharing. Uh, so that I can. No, you should. Yes, yes, yes. So that's how you will start and you will uh, introduce and then structure. Okay, so I'm going to start in uh, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, now you're live now, so you're supposed to be able to... Hello, Wel welcome back uh, from the break. Um, this is Daniel Archambeau again. So for this session, we will have a total of um, three paper presentations, and then we will have a panel discussion involving all the paper presenters where we can answer questions uh, together on Zoom. Uh, live. So let's just get started with the first of our three paper presentations. So this will uh, be Daniel Johnson speaking on uh, visual analysis of impact of neural network hyperparameters. Thank you very much. No sound on the YouTube. Is there an error?
regression analysis of the impact of neural network hyperparameters. This work is a collaboration between Lichaper University in Sweden and Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Imagine you have set up a convolutional neural network and are about to start a training. One of the first things that you need to do is to choose the hyperparameters for the training. Hyperparameters are all the training variables set manually with a predetermined value before starting the training. Examples include the batch size, determining how many samples per iteration that should be used, or the optimizer to use for the loss function. The hyperparameters span a high dimensional space, so finding an optimal combination is really a non-trivial problem. In general, you solve this through an iterative approach, where you first choose hyperparameters, then do a full training, then evaluate the performance and stability of the train model, and then you iterate. Of course, doing iteration is compute intensive, so you want to minimize them. There is a large amount of existing work considering the importance of different hyperparameters and approaches to optimize them. Basically, you end up with three different approaches. You can do a manual search by using prior knowledge or best practices to select good parameters. You can steer the search process using interactive visual analysis tools in a human-in-the-loop approach, or you can do a fully automatic approach using optimization methods. Our work falls in between the manual and the human-in-the-loop approaches, where we use interactive visual analysis to try to understand the hyperparameter space and distill general knowledge about it. So, the goal in our work is not to find the best set of parameters for a specific model, but instead get a general understanding of the performance relationship between neural networks and hyperparameters. Because training the models for all parameter combinations are compute intensive, we use as a starting point the work from classifying the classifier, dissecting the weight space of neural networks accepted to ECHI 2020, uh, in the supplementary material, we find 13,000 models trained with randomly selected hyperparameters. For hyperparameters, we use a loose definition where we also include the data set, for example. We have varying difficulties of data sets from the simple MNIST digits to STL10 natural images. We include batch size, which is the number of samples utilized in one iteration, augmentation, which is small perturbations of the data set to increase the sample size. Examples are rotations or translations. And the optimizer, which is the technique used to minimize the loss function. We have the neuron activation function and also the weight initialization function. We refer to, the class, to classifying the classifier uh, paper for more details on the, on the actual trainings and setup. So to facilitate exploration for the many parameters at the same time, we utilize overview and filter techniques combined with data aggregation and small multiples plots. We take the 13,000 neural networks and compute the distributions of their test accuracy. The user can filter based on uh, test accuracy to find out which parameter combinations that, are, that produce good or bad models. We provide an overview of the parameter combinations linked to the current filter, and then the user can go into details about the subset of parameters to explore their high-dimensional hyperparameter interconnections. This approach allows the user to distill high-dimensional information about the 13,000 models. I will now explain each step in a bit more detail. The two central parts in our exploration are input data, which largely affect the test accuracy, and the test accuracy itself. Therefore, we provide an overview of these two central parts using a stacked histogram, depicting the distribution of the test accuracy for the different data sets. As you can see in this distribution plot, each data set has its own mode, which is caused by their underlying complexity. For example, STL10 ranges between 0 and 60%. So it's not easy to compare or select good models for STL10 and MNIST at the same time. 
In order to enable such a comparison, we perform a linear per data set normalization. This will result in a normalized plot where the user now can select the best or worst models for multiple data sets at the same time. For example, selecting the 90 to 100% range would filter out the models performing best. Additionally, one, uh, one or more data sets can be selected for isolated analysis. The test accuracy range selection serves as a basis for exploring combinations of parameters. Because we are dealing with thousands of networks, we need to aggregate the information to obtain an overview. We do this through a heat map matrix. The heat map matrix represents the number of networks included in the selection for each combination of two parameters. So for example, if you've selected models with high test accuracy, the heat map matrix elements depicting high counts indicate good parameter combinations. Similarly, given a selection of low test accuracy, the combinations depicting high counts indicate bad parameter combinations. So we are utilizing frequency to understand the relationship between the parameter combinations. The frequency can be used for comparison in this way since the parameter settings were initially randomly selected. So if we combine this with interaction, the user first selected dataset and test accuracy of interest. Here we have selected the main mode of the CIFAR 10 and the STL 10 datasets. In other words, the most common occurrence of model accuracy when randomly selecting a parameter combination. The heat map matrix is updated accordingly to represent the selection and now provides an overview of which parameter combinations that end up in the main mode for these two datasets. Based on this overview, we might identify a set of parameter combinations that are of particular interest, but we cannot see beyond the combination of two parameters. In this case, we need to enable, be able to see higher dimensions at the same time. For this purpose, we provide a detailed view where the user can select the two parameters, one primary and one secondary, that were of special interest. Here, each parameter is split by its option, such as on and off for augmentation, which result in one plot per option. Test accuracy is depicted on the horizontal axis and the selected primary parameter on the vertical axis. The secondary parameter is encoded as shape and color, and its mark represent the average test accuracy of the current model selection. In this way, we can analyze how the test accuracy varies for multidimensional parameter combinations using spatial juxtaposition. For example, we can see how the different parameters vary with dataset and choice of optimizer. It is easy to see that modern optimizer techniques, such as ADAM and RMS prop indicated by the circle and triangle, outperform the conventional momentum optimizer indicated by the square. With the presented tool for visual analysis, it is possible to discover many different properties of how hyperparameter combinations impact performance. In the following, I will begin with showing an example of analyzing augmentation using the overview plot. Then I will go into more detailed analysis of the impact of different optimizers. At first inspection, it seems that augmentation has a small impact on the results, which is also supported by the simple correlation analysis in classifying the classifier paper. However, as we show in our work, this does not represent the complete picture. Here we have zoomed in on the augmentation to focus on its combination with initialization, activation, and optimizer. Augmentation has different impacts depending on the hyperparameters and on the data sets. First of all, augmentation has less effect on the more artificial datasets, such as MNIST, Fashion MNIST, and SVHN. By selecting only the more difficult datasets, uh, CIFAR 10 and STL 10, we can explore the distribution of hyperparameter combinations across different test accuracies. If we only select a training centered around the main mode of uh, <coughs> performance, the most frequent training outcomes we can see that no augmentation is most common. However, selecting only the top models, there is a clear benefit in using augmentation. This indicates that only the more difficult optimization problems effectively make use of augmentation 
and does so in a limited number of trainings. We can also see that a good combination of optimizer, initialization, and activation functions seem to be important for achieving top performance. So let's explore those parameters in more detail. So now we move on to the detail view and we have selected the initialization as primary parameter and focus on the optimizer without any filters applied. We can see that the performance uh, of the momentum optimizer is tightly connected with the initialization scheme. So having a good initialization, initialization scheme seemed to be more important than having a good optimizer. With that being said, the more, uh, more modern optimizers better cope with the poor initialization schemes. We can further analyze the impact of the third parameter, such as batch size. Each parameter is now further split by the batch size, which is indicated by the different shapes. Here we can see that while both Adam and RMS prop generate results almost invariant to the batch size, the conventional momentum optimizer has negative correlation between the batch size and accuracy. In other words, the performance is better for smaller batch sizes. Switching the third parameter to activation function, we can see that, for example, if ELU activation, indicated by the blue circles, is used together with GLORET initialization, then the momentum optimizer performs on par with state-of-the-art optimizers. An interesting observation is that the ELU activation shows a consistent small improvement over the widely used ReLU in most circumstances. We can again see that there is a large discrepancy between the optimizer when the constant or random normal <coughs> initialization schemes are used. To conclude, we have introduced a set of tailored visual analysis tools for revealing detailed information on the interplay between neural network hyperparameters. We use the tools to study performance of 13,000 convolutional neural networks and reported a selection of interesting dependencies between hyperparameters. We saw how the most optimal combination of optimizer, activation function, and initialization in conjunction with augmented training data is required to reach the highest accuracy on natural images. However, it's still only a fraction of the trainings with these settings that actually reach top performance. Of course, the analysis provided is limited to the trained networks, which are comparably small. However, the uh, analysis will naturally extend to the more advanced models if they were to be computed. As future work, it would be interesting to combine the visual analysis with more statistical methods to further guide the user in, in their exploration process. Thank you for listening to my talk. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we have Daniel. I'm Daniel. We have Daniel. Hi, and now, hi. now um, we are ready to uh, take a few questions. So, uh, Ian, uh, do we have any questions on uh, YouTube? Ian, Yako, any questions? Uh, yeah. So uh, there are, right, here we go, yes. Um, I've got one here from Elio Ventocilla. Uh, thanks, could the gained insights be generalized to some extent so that one could say which combination of parameters will be more likely to result in higher accuracy in spite of the data set? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, that's, uh, so the, it does so, on the assets that we tested on, 
uh, and I think that it would be necessary to do more tests on more advanced uh, uh, models uh, and also see how the so now the different test data sets were uh, uh, a little bit vary but uh, also not uh, uh, to some extent also coherent uh, so having more advanced uh, data sets to test on would be interesting uh, so I think uh, they to some extent uh, 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 do generalize uh, since also in many of the results that we show are uh, also shown in the papers that present the different methods. So uh, we do hope that the, the, the findings that we, um, that we also present that are kind of new, uh, that they uh, would be um, valid for other data sets. But uh, I think more, more, uh, more testing would be necessary to confirm this. Okay. Yako. There are two questions uh, from Discord. Uh, the first one is from Udo Schlegel, who asks, uh, did you find some interesting points going against the general liter literature? Um, that's a very good question. Um, not sure about against, but I think um, more in line with the additional uh, like uh, uh, one would expect that uh, adding uh, augmentation would always improve the results but uh, uh, it seems to do so only for the more advanced or difficult data sets uh, which I think was a little bit surprising uh, so I'm not sure that's not really against but uh, I would say it is additional all right uh, the second question is from Angelos Katsin Barbas, and he asks that uh, why do you focus on more than one particular data set at the same time for finding the best hyperparameters, uh, the hyperparameter combination? So, do you think that this choice can hinder you from finding the best hyperparameters for a single data set? Uh, yes, so what we're really trying to focus, in, <coughs> focus on is on the generalization. Uh, so, we want to find more general uh, knowledge about the hyperparameters. It's not really specific on uh, one for one data set. Uh, that would, of course, be possible if we just select one data set, then you can an analyze that one. Uh, but uh, by analyzing different types of data sets, uh, we hope that you can generalize this to other data sets uh, of similar types. I hope that that answers uh, the questions. It's a little bit difficult without the feedback. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Udo Schlegel, for the first question. Thank you for the for the answer already, and Angelus also. Thank you. So I think those were good answers. Good. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll probably proceed to the next paper. There will be an opportunity for a panel discussion at the end of uh, these uh, papers. So our next presentation is by uh, Michael C. Turin, and it's on improving the sensitivity of statistical testing for clusterability with mirror density plots. Welcome to my presentation. Welcome to my presentation about improving the sensitivity of statistical testing for clusterability with mirrored density plots. Conventional approaches in this topic are either focusing projection methods like TSE, NERF or ESOM, or so-called distance acquiring visualizations, for example cluster heat maps, dendrograms, 
or the estimation of the so-called probability density function of intercluster distances. Such approaches require often explicit or implicit prior assumptions. For, a, for example, the decision which distance measure has to be used, um, or at the clustering has already to be performed with a specific criterion, or various parameters have to be set. In this workshop paper, clustering is defined as similar objects being within a cluster and dissimilar objects being outside the cluster. And in this, in this slide, two data sets are investigated. On the top, a golf ball, and on the bottom, leukemia. Golf ball has no cluster structures per definition, and leukemia has specific cluster structures. We see in the unsupervised projection method that both data sets have cluster structures on the top at least two and the bottom at least four. And if we use a hierarchical clustering algorithm, we can visualize a dendrogram and decide by the uh, highest change in diffusion levels how many clusters we would like. And for both data sets, we can select an appropriate number of clusters. This number of clusters on the right can also be visualized with uh, the MD plot, which is the same, uh, is very similar to the violin plot. And in the first, uh, first violin, we see the full distance distribution. And in the next violins, we see the, the distributions of intra cluster distances of each specific cluster. We see here that the intra cluster distances are smaller than the full distance distribution. Well, so with all methods, it's, it looked like both datasets had specific cluster structures, but the top dataset do not have any cluster structures. Alternative approaches prior to clustering are based on statistical testing. Usually, the multimodalities are investigated. For example, uh, the first principal component uh, is tested which is based on the linear projection of PCA, and we know that PCA maximizes the data variance. Multimodality of the distance distribution can be investigated, or on the principal curve of the data. Common statistical investigations of multimodalities are the IKIK information criterion, the bimodality coefficient, or two statistical tests called Harbinger's dip tests, and Silverman test. The idea of this workshop paper is to combine statistical testing with a visualization prior to clustering. For this use case, the mirror density plot, in short MD plot, is used, which visualizes the density similar to a violin or box plot and was already shown in the second slide. For density estimation, here the Pareto density estimation approach is used because it is particularly sensitive to multimodality. We showed in a, uh, in a publication which is currently in revision that comparable methods had difficulties in visualizing, visualizing the probability density function in case of uniform, multimodal or skewed or clipped data. Investigated were beam plots, violin plots, and rich line plots in R and Python. The advantage of the MD plot is that it does not require any adjustments of parameters for density estimation. So, uh, we have to use the clusterability with the MD plot with several insights. So, the first insight is we do not want to test everything, so we focus on um, specific combinations which prove to be preferable in the prior publication of Adolfson et al, namely the distance distribution and the first principal component investigation for multimodality. But we do not use Silverman and DIP test because another publication of Freeman and Dell showed that the DIP test has the highest sensitivity for multimodality. But even then, sometimes distributions can be multimodal but not significant with statistical testing itself. 
So, in this case, one can overlay the distribution with a robustly estimated Gaussian. Also, we want to present in this uh, workshop paper several datasets at once with very varying values of the first principal component. And to visualize this in one visualization, we use the robust transformation of Milliken and Cooper because it does not change the shape of the distribution. So, we uh, used specific 30 datasets. Theta Romula and leukemia are high dimensional, but are really well investigated in literature and have for sure cluster structures. We have two datasets, Golfball and Unit Square, which are defined such that they have no cluster structures. All other datasets have specific challenges for cluster analysis and are generated under the hypothesis that humans are most often able to group objects in two or three dimensional plots using their eyes. So, let's look at the first result. Here we have presented the MD plot for these 13 datasets. On the y axis we have the PDE, so a density estimation, and on the x axis we have each data, data set in alphabetical order. The p value shown there is computed by the cluster ability pack R, R package of uh, Adolfson et al. And a low p value means that the probability is high that the data set has a cluster structure. So, uh, in the red arrows marked here, we have two cases where the internal statistical testing of the MD plot showed that there are no multimodalities in the data and therefore automatically a robust Gaussian in magenta is estimated and overlaid with the distribution. To this enables a more distinct visualization if multimodalities are present in a distribution. So, for this investigation, the common PCA was used and the first principal, common, uh, principal component is visualized and we see that statistical testing does not indicate any cluster tendencies for the data set marked by the red circuits. We see that for this data set, the MD plot still shows multimodalities in the case of HEPTA, target, and very slightly for winglet, but for tetra it doesn't show any multimodality. We can use uh, in the clusterability package of Allison et al. either the usual PCA or a centered and scaled PCA. This is done in this experiment shown on this slide. In the case of a centered and scaled PCA, the first principal component looks different. And we still see that several data sets do not have any cluster structure according to statistical testing and often do not have also no cluster structure according to the visualization. The third approach is to investigate the full distance distribution. This is shown here. What we see is that the density based data sets of NG time two daemons and wingnuts have no multimodalities, neither in statistical testing or in the visualization, and golf ball, which do not have any cluster structures, has a high probability to have a cluster tendency according to statistical testing. So, in sum, we have a false agreement of datasets for the ND plot and statistical testing. This is the case for Tetra and Wingnut and several datasets with contradicting tendencies. Wingnut and, data and Tetra are visualized below and what we see here that both datasets have low intercluster distances and no predominant direction of variance. So, let's assume that we do not know that these datasets have cluster structures uh, and we now have to use a projection method to evaluate if a cluster structure exists. In this case, we use the Data Bionic Swarm, published uh, this year, because it is parameter-free. 
The swarm consists of three modules. The clustering module is not important here, but the projection module and the visualization with the topographic map is used in this workshop paper. Let's skip the, the details and look at an example. We have on the left the golf ball data set visualized by the topographic map and on the right the Leukemia data set. We see that the Leukemia dataset has a clear structure of valleys in the topographic map. We see four valleys and two outliers, but the Golf by dataset has no clear valleys. Therefore, one dataset has cluster structures and the Golf by dataset does not have any cluster structures. Such an evaluation was done on the contradicting results of uh, the datasets investigated and it showed that in every time the MD plot was correct and statistical testing was incorrect. We even were able to detect cluster structures for Tetra and Wingnut. Um, such an approach of projection and topographic map of course can be used not only for the DBS projection but also for methods like NERF or ESOM but then the user has to choose the appropriate parameter setting for these projection methods. What we also showed is that scaling and centering of PCA did not improve the statistical testing or the visualization uh, in the case of cluster ability. It seems for me that it is based on prior assumptions about the data in R, but uh, this is out of scope of this workshop. The next conclusion is that statistical testing for clustering tendency is not appropriate for distance distributions if the data sets are based on density. On the one hand this is obvious, but on the other hand it was not reported in prior studies, for example in Adolfson et al. We saw, and this is surprising, that the first principal component detects the existence of cluster structures quite well. This is surprising because the cluster structures are quite complicated and usually the first, the first two or three principal components do not visualize these cluster structures correctly. For example, one does not know which point belongs to which cluster and one cannot estimate the number of clusters of a PCA projection. This is uh, with the exception of clearly linear separable data sets like Hector. So, in summary, 13 data sets were used which had a specific cluster structures that could be either separated by the human eye or was already well investigated in the literature or could not be separated by the human eye and therefore was not a clustering structure for example in the golf ball data set. The evaluation of the cluster ability on these data sets demonstrated that the sensitivity of statistical testing can be improved by using the MD plot. The detection of cluster ability was even possible for complex cluster structures and could be performed prior to clustering or projection or selection of a distance measure. But the detection of cluster ability still remains challenging for specific data sets which have almost touching clusters, so low intercluster distances and do not have any predominant direction of variance. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you uh, very much for the presentation. I'm wondering if we have any questions since either on the, on the um, Discord or YouTube. We do not yet have any questions in the Welcome Discord. Welcome everyone, my name is Dominic no, Rose. Not and just yet, like but that, it, it always lags a little bit on YouTube.
the applause is just coming through. So there you go, Sebastian. Maybe I could ask a question. So um, it seems that the method is centrally dependent on the ability to have the density plots uh, on a line corresponding to to a direction. So is there some way to to extend this or to avoid situations which I think you mentioned that okay, if there isn't if the cluster ability isn't really revealed by one one direction like the direction of most variability then is there something that can be done mm, yeah, could you please repeat the questions i had the uh, sound feedback from one of the uh, participants <laughs> and i okay. had, and uh, I had to shut it out first i was asking that is there any any kind of extension or something that could be done when you don't have one clear direction uh, along which you could uh, draw a very good uh, MD plot. So, like, if, if the cluster ability isn't really revealed by one particular direction. No, this this was the challenging part which I could not resolve because I could only visualize uh, distributions for which statistical testing uh, was already invented by someone else. And in this case, where there is no predominant direction of variance, uh, statistical testing fails, and I visualize only unimodal distributions. So I don't know how to resolve this challenge. All right. Thank you. So are there any further questions? Um, either the YouTube or Discord, further questions? At least the Discord we still do not have. No, there's nothing on YouTube at the moment. Okay. Well, um, there will be an opportunity at the end of the, the panel for further questions and that sort of stuff. So uh, let's uh, thank Michael again, and we will then proceed to the next presentation. So this is given by Tomas uh, Gotz. Hopefully I, I pronounced that correctly. Uh, visual interpretation of DNN-based acoustic models using deep autoencoders. So thank you. Welcome everyone, my name is Tomasz Gross and I'd like to talk about how deep autoencoders can be used for visual interpretation of DNN-based acoustic models. First of all, let me talk about the motivation of our work. It's safe to say that DNNs in the past few years have become the state of the art in many fields. Unfortunately, to this day they are viewed as black boxes. This causes some issues as it is important to know how and why they work to build a proper system. Also, if we want to use it in commercial systems, it is important to build trust in the system, and if we cannot say how and why they work, it, the users will not trust our system. Also, it's important to uh, use these visualization methods or other inspection methods to identify learning issues like overfitting or underfitting in the system. So visual interpretation basically means that we try to show the hidden representation of the data that are formed inside the deep neural network. It is a very hard task as we need to transform the high dimensional data somehow into two dimensional vectors. One of the tools that can be used for this transformation is these elastic neighbor embedding. It is a well-known and widely used tool. Probably many of you have already used it. It has two steps. In the first step, we calculate the distances between points using a probabilistic approach. 
That means we calculate the probability of two points choosing each other as the closest neighbors. After we calculated these probabilities for the high-dimensional and low-dimensional data, we can move on to the optimization step. In the optimization step, we try to find a layout that minimizes the good luck library divergence between the low-dimensional probabilities and the high-dimensional probabilities. This approach has a major issue, namely that the optimization is performed on the same data that we want to visualize. It means that if we change some of the data, we could potentially modify the entire layout. Another tool for visualization is called Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. It's an alternative to the stochastic neighbor embedding algorithm, and it's a bit more complicated than the SNA. The algorithm has the following steps. First, we try to find the manifold on which the data points are uniformly distributed. For real data, this is a very strong assumption, and that's why we usually use a Riemann metric. Then, we try to extract the fuzzy topological representation, both for the original and the embedded data. After we did these steps, we again apply an optimization step, where we try to minimize the cross-entropy between the two topological representation in order to find the optimal layout of the data. Again, I'd like to point out that this method too optimizes using the visualization data, and that also means that it is very sensible for the data. In our work, we explored the possibility of using deep autoencoders for visualization. These autoencoders are general tools for dimension reduction. They are a special type of neural networks and consist of two parts, an encoder and a decoder. The encoder task is to compress the information present in the input, and the decoder learns to decompress it. The two parts are connected through a bottleneck layer that basically extracts the embeddings. In our experiments, we used an hourglass-like architecture to gradually reduce the input dimension to the 2D vectors. The main advantage of this method is that after training, we can use uh, the encoder part without any optimization. This also means that autoencoders produce the very same coordinates for a given vector, regardless of the rest of the data. Naturally, we wanted to compare these methods, so we needed an appropriate evaluation metric for that. The problem is that an ideal criteria to compare them doesn't exist. Our answer to this problem was the usage of three different metrics. The first one, called Procrastus Distance, which was applied before to compare the TSNE with the UMAP method. It basically tries to answer the question, how well can we reconstruct the high-dimensional data from the low-dimensional embeddings? In practice, it looks for an optimal transformation from the low-dimensional data to the high-dimensional data, then uses the mean square error of this optimal transformation uh, to measure the quality of the embeddings. The second metric that we used was the mutual information between the low-dimensional and the high-dimensional data. It is a very standard metric that measures the mutual dependence between the two sets. Here, we specifically use the PSG method to estimate the entropy, as it cannot be estimated uh, using the standard method. Lastly, we also use distant correlation, which is a completely different metric from the previous two. It measures the correlation between the paired vectors of any arbitrary dimensional data. In our experiments, we inspected an acoustic DNN that had five hidden layers, and each hidden layer contained 1,000 rectified linear units. This network structure is quite common and quite standard in acoustic modeling. This network was trained on the English Wall Street Journal corpus, and its goal was to recognize phonemes based on the spectral input. 
for inspection, we randomly selected three files from the test set, and these files were previously not seen by the acoustic DNN. Then, we saved the hidden vectors produced for these three files and transformed them for inspection. The hyperparameters of TSNE and UMAP were optimized using the data produced by the first hidden layer. Autoencoders were trained on the hidden representation that were generated from, for the training part of this corpus. This, of course, means that during optimization, they didn't see any of the test vectors, while the other methods di directly optimized the layout of the test data. We also tried what happens if we feed more data to UMAP, and uh, we did it by adding 300 training files to the first step, where it basically looks for the appropriate manifold. Keep in mind that the optimization step for this method was still performed using the test vectors. Now let's take a look at the experimental results. First of all, we can see that autoencoders managed to perform quite well despite their disadvantage, which was that they didn't see this data during their training. Based on the PD values, autoencoders proved to be the best, and UMAP outperformed TSNE in most cases. In terms of mutual information, we can see that UMAP approaches achieved the best results, except for the third layer where autoencoders were the best. Looking at the MI rows, we can see that autoencoders came second, outperforming TSNE in most cases. Lastly, looking at the correlation values, we can also see that both autoencoders and UMAP performed quite well. One interesting thing to notice is that using more data to estimate the manifold, uh, the UMAP train column is not always beneficial. One very crucial detail that actually makes this comparison a bit unfair is that autoencoders were absolutely not trained on this data, while the others optimized their transformation directly using these vectors. Overall, we can say that our proposed methods are on pair with UMAP, and TSNA is the worst option out of the four methods we compared here. After the objective evaluation, let's move on to the visual one. Here we can see the visualizations of the first hidden layer, which process the input directly. Technically, it is a very crucial part of any DNNs, as it must learn to extract meaningful low-level features. What we can see here is that the silent parts form the separate cluster from the other categories. Interestingly, some black dots are mixed with the other categories. Upon closer inspection, we determined that these the points are actually silent frames in the immediately before or after the words, and they are probably mislabeled by the automatic method that we use to align the phonetic labels to the acoustic data. This way, we determined that the DNN learned that some inputs have wrong labels and classified these correctly. This is actually a great benefit of inspecting the models, as we can find out whether there are inconsistencies in the data or not. Beyond that, it is also visible that this layer starts to distinguish vowels from consonants, the red and the green points, to some degree, but they were not yet clearly separated. One last thing I need to point out is the difference between UMAP and UMAP train. Technically, the only difference between them is that the later used more data before optimization. Still, they are visualizing the same vectors, so technically they should look very similar. Unfortunately, we can see the differences between them, especially when we look at the red cluster. This reinforces our issue with UMAP and actually with TSNE, that adding some extra data changed the layout significantly. Next, we turned our attention to the last hidden layer, which is also a very important part of the DNN, as the output layer makes decisions based on the output of this layer. Once again, the silent part were recognized very accurately. Furthermore, we can see that the consonants were isolated from vowels, especially by the autoencoder-based method. 
again, the two images in the middle, the UMAP and UMAP train, were very different because of the extra data. Interestingly, in the autoencoder-generated image, additional subclusters of consonants can be observed. Upon closer inspection, we determine that the upper part contains mainly nasals, while the lower one is a fricative cluster. Furthermore, between them, another cluster of stub phonemes seems to be formed. This also confirms that the higher layers of the DNN are forming more specialized clusters, which was already observed in other works. Keep in mind that the network learned to form these clusters on its own, and we did not provide any information to it about phonetic groups. In conclusion, we saw that our proposed visualization approach is quite competitive with the other methods, even though it doesn't optimize the layout of the data that we want to visualize. A significant advantage of the autoencoder-based visualization is that we can train it with a large amount of data. And after training, of course, the encoder applies a fixed transformation to produce the coordinates. This also means that the visualization will not be affected by artifacts present only in the data that we wish to show, as the transformation process is not changed by this data. An additional bonus is that autoencoders are very fast after training, even if we want to visualize a lot of data. The other methods have trouble handling more and more data. The main problem is that the SNE and UMAP perform optimization using all data at once, while autoencoders could perform the transformation of vectors separately and possibly in parallel. I must also say that there is a dire need for a standard single metric that we can use to measure the performance of these methods. Specifically, in our case, we need a metric to measure how well we visualize the high-dimensional data. Thank you for your attention, and now we have plenty of time for questions. Oh, thank you very much um, for your presentation, Tomas. I'm, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly. Apologies if I'm not. Um, I'm wondering if we have uh, any questions from YouTube Live or from Discord. So I believe um, I'm wondering if we, have we are getting questions some questions from Discord. We have the first one. Uh, so one question from Udo Schlegel is that did you experiment with variational autoencoders to change the latent space distribution? Actually, uh, I started, but uh, I'm still at the uh, part where I try to find the stable hyperparameters for the variational autoencoders. But I think they could be also used for this. Thank you. Uh, there is another question on Discord from Daniel Jönsson, who asks, uh, could you elaborate on what the comparison metric should ideally measure? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think that's the very first step that we need to take. But generally, somehow, we need to measure uh, how much information we lose by uh, reducing the dimensions from the high uh, value to the 2D. So basically we need something similar to mutual information, but we need to somehow estimate entropy better because right now it estimates entropy based on distances. And as we know in high dimensions, uh, distances are not really meaningful. I hope this answers the question. So basically, we need some way to estimate information loss. Thank you. I believe we are getting a third I've question. On, I've got one on YouTube. 
Jaco, perhaps we can cut in. Uh, this one comes from Douglas Cedrim Oliveira, uh, who asks, how does it perform on ranking quality measures? For example, those which take account neighbourhood preservation. Yes. Uh, well, actually, I tried a very simple method and uh, preserves most of the neighborhoods, but uh, I must say that the SNE and GUMAP are better at preserving the local neighborhood because they are actually optimizing on that data uh, that we want to visualize. So outdoor encoders in general are not preserving the very local, uh, very small cluster uh, structure, but they somehow manage to get the overall layout. And they have this added bonus that they are not affected by extra data. Okay, Douglas says thanks. Okay, are there any further questions? Uh, there are people typing on Discord, so there isn't uh, a posted question yet, but maybe there will be come something okay um we'll wait a, a another second or two but um after that we're going to be switching over to the panel so we'll have opportunities for plenty of questions then Uh, okay, so there isn't a question but from a, from a statement from Angelos Katsin Parmpas and that there are several metrics that measure uh, things like this, like continuity, trustworthiness, etc. But they might not be even they might not be enough, even if you have them. And uh, Udo Schlegel also comments that you could include this kind of ranking metric into the loss function to take neighborhoods into account. Yes, um, all all good points. I think what we're going to be doing now, as you notice, uh, the speaker has left the uh, screen on YouTube Live. We're switching over to the panel mode, and in the panel mode, um, you'll be able to see all of the speakers from today's sessions. And uh, you will be able to ask questions both on YouTube Live and on uh, Discord and uh, we will answer those questions uh, there. So it's just gonna take a few minutes while they switch over the presentation mode uh, in the background. Please um, stick around. Um, I shouldn't say a few minutes, more like a few seconds, probably about a half minute. And here we are. I managed to talk all the way through that. So, on the left, we have basically everybody who spoke today, and on the right, we'll be highlighting the person who is speaking. Um, you will be able to, as usual, type into the Discord or type into the um, Google Live chat on the right, and we will field questions about any of the topics we spoke today. There is a question on YouTube uh, from Dennis Colaris, who uh, says, um, apologies if he missed this during the presentation. So this is the last talk, I think. But he was wondering how the running time of autoencoders compared against the other methods. So yeah. one for Tomas. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, it depends. Uh, basically, um, to train them, it takes a lot of time, but after we train them, they produce the uh, coordinates for these three files in, within one second. I think UMAP needed like a few minutes and the SME took like 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, once I added more data to the UMAP method, it took like 20 minutes to produce the embeddings. So in general, uh, it takes a long time to train the autoencoder, but afterwards it's very, very fast if you have a very good GPU.
Thank you, Thomas. There seems to be a huge lag between the Zoom and the YouTube. On YouTube, I've just finished asking the question. <laughs> Another question on my, uh, from Michael Thrun. Which library do you use for the autoencoders? I use TensorFlow. So maybe I could pose a question overall to the speakers, uh, the same one that was actually raised to me during the tutorial part, which is this uh, rise of the deep neural networks and how that affects the role of uh, visualization approaches. Because many things that we've uh, had as typical kinds of visualizations may not be easily applicable to deep neural network based approaches. So do we have to give up the kinds of things we are used to? Um, is it all layer wise uh, plots uh, of the kinds uh, that that we heard in the last presentation? Uh, so is it a bottleneck for visualization or is it an opportunity? How do you feel? Perhaps I can just say something. Uh, I think there are two parts. First of all, uh, using these techniques in visualization or for visualization. And then there are the explaining the, the actual deep learning uh, methods. And I think there, in, in both uh, parts, there are tons of stuff to explore. And we really just started to, to do this. Uh, and it's quite hard. Uh, some techniques, uh, I think, uh, can be used to some extent, but uh, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, methods that you need to develop to to dig in, dig out this the underlying knowledge that are in the networks. I mean, we know very little of how they function. Uh, now, that's my five cents. Um, I think we have a great opportunity now to um, change the visualizations and um, the work we do now because um, we can either do it while training and before training, but especially after training because the um, while and the before training takes a lot of or till it is after training then takes a lot of time. So we now come to the point where we um, have to tackle the after training and we have to really think about what we can do to um, yeah, support the users, because um, this is the most critical part about neural networks. There is no such easy solution like showing this and that, and then you understand it, but you have to really target your visualization towards the needs of the users. So um, I think that's it's a great opportunity, and we have to go more in this direction of explaining um, yeah, for example, the output. Can I play devil's advocate here for a moment in the sense that there's quite a lot about interpretation and users and so on. I didn't see many users other than the people writing the papers mentioned in, in the talks. So have people done anything with these mythical users out there outside of the research lab? Um, Actually, good question, <laughs> because that's that's what I to try to do. <laughs> it's exactly my research work, <laughs> and um, the problem is often that there's a mismatch between 
what we think the good visualization is for a user and the user thinks what a good visualization is and how much he even wants to comprehend. And in most cases, um, you really, it's hard to get to these users you really want to because um, in many cases, they just doesn't care. There is now a few um, starting points, for example, to um, um, explain deep neural network decisions um, to be able to use them in court in Germany, for example. But um, yeah, we are still not far in this direction. So it's really just a few steps um, towards the bigger goal of getting to these users. <laughs> it reminds me a bit of how someone, I think someone's written that the, that uh, most psychological theory that was developed in the 1950s and 60s was essentially the psychology of graduate students, because that's the only people you could get in to do your experiments on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly my feeling. <laughs> So I can add uh, that we didn't have a formal user study in, uh, in our paper, but uh, there was uh, uh, one expert that did use uh, our tool to explore the parameter space. Uh, um, and of course, I mean, performing a formal study would require quite a lot of much, uh, a lot more work, uh, not only on the like, uh, gathering the study, but also making the tool uh, usable for uh, a study. Uh, so I think that should not be underestimated, but you, uh, it's hard to put in the paper, uh, but it's a, a lot of more work to really uh, do those last 10% that uh, make sure that you can sp uh, spread it out. So I think uh, we generally are quite good at doing these concepts. Uh, uh, perhaps we should practice on uh, or getting uh, uh, those 10% as well to, to do the final study. If I can put in perhaps a little bit of my personal experience, this is where working with industrial partners was really helpful because they would literally ask me questions which other researchers don't ask, right, because they take time or effort or whatever to resolve. Uh, so I remember showing a visualization plot and they were saying, oh, yes, that looks interesting in the bottom right hand corner. Tell me what's going on there. And I realized that all the fancy machine learning I was doing for data projection actually wasn't enough because it didn't enable them to answer the questions they really wanted to answer. And so that can be, I mean, it's, it's, it's a slightly wider group of people. It's not necessarily the person, in the, the mythical person in the street, but it does give you uh, people who are prepared to ask questions that another academic researcher won't ask. Yeah, if I might add, uh, it's been sort of the case as well. Uh, maybe not in this paper, but in, a, in another paper, I uh, tried to show the training process of an algorithm. And uh, the users in this case, they were interested in the results themselves and not the inner workings of the algorithm. So I guess it's very dependent on the target user. I guess if, if you're targeting uh, modelers, as I've read somewhere that they exist, uh, then uh, uh, some of these visualizations would be useful for them. But not for everyone, right? Yeah. yeah, that's my point. For me, one thing that is in this layer-wise approach is, is is kind of difficult is that if you are dealing with something which is ultimately a complicated phenomenon to analyze, then often you would have to have stages where you're basically just assembling the pieces that you need for, for the final prediction, so whatever they are. So it doesn't mean that, they, that the intermediate representations would have to be somehow intuitive by themselves. Like, if we think about these very common image examples, you typically show that, okay, you get small features and then you get larger features and so on. So that's still assuming that each of the individual stages has to have some kind of very intuitive meaning on its own. But it could just as well be that they are something that you can't really understand except mathematically on their own. But then later in combination with something that happens later, 
only then they become something valuable or understandable. So this is something that worries me about this having these different stages and trying to force every one of them to be individually explainable or understandable. Yeah, but the point is that um, if you would understand, for example, this intermediate um, layers, you could um, help model developers in um, exchanging one layer or two, and then to steer it to get it yeah, to just train faster or to train to have a better prediction. So this is, on the other hand, a problem. So, Well, I'm really cautioning against oversimplifying. I don't mean that understandability is bad. I, I just mean that, if you think, for example, about how mathematical proofs work, very often it's so that if you look at the intermediate steps that are done in a proof, they seem kind of weird. Okay, why are we doing this? Why are we creating these kinds of intermediate notations? And then only at the end, it all comes together. The, oh, okay, this is why we needed them. So by oversimplifying, I mean that if you try to make them individually intuitive, then it could actually hurt their performance ultimately. Uh, sorry. Uh, in that uh, train of thought, maybe, um, I think in that explanations, and probably when it comes to visual explanations, they most probably should be tailored to the audience as well. Uh, there's an example of a research of a colleague of mine where they were uh, performing or creating explanations from deep neural networks in terms of uh, linear equations. And this was very useful for the the domain they were addressing the solutions to, they understood these equations because they made use of them before, but maybe these sort of explanations would not be uh, useful for many other users, right? So maybe this is not a one size fits all, right? Either. No, it, and we were we were speaking uh, previously about uh, interpretability of the inner workings of the machine learning algorithm and the explainability of the results. And these are definitely two very different tasks. So not only do you have this level, but you you also need to consider the technical expertise of your users. Are you trying to explain something? I don't know. Um, the the pandemic we're going through right now to the general public. Or are you trying to help public health officials? Those are two very different visualizations with very different purposes and very different office, uh, audiences. Just a quick technical question, Daniel. Do you happen to know, uh, are people hearing, uh, if uh, is Adrenaline is the audience only hearing us through YouTube Live? Because if they are, they're about two or three minutes behind us, so we're never going to get any questions. <laughs> there is a nice comment, great points, but that's probably about the points we were making three minutes ago. <laughs> As, as Paul, uh, panel moderators, what we could uh, potentially do is just wait a few seconds and say, are there further questions that uh, we, we um, from either uh, YouTube Live or uh, from the Discord, and we can read them out to the panelists. And there are not, at least not on Discord. There was um, uh, Thomas uh, Gross uh, thanked Udo for his earlier uh, suggestion to, to include those ranking metrics into, into the loss functions. Uh, so this was uh, about the last presentation. So this kind of comment came in, but not, not yet any other questions.
me, another threat that we have uh, seems to be this um, efficiency of trying out different things. The model specs paper was kind of about that, how, how to how to do these uh, trainings in an efficient way. And on the other hand, we had this uh, network hyperparameter analysis, which is also about trying different parameters. So on the one hand, we are having massively parallel implementations, but on the other hand, we have a parameter explosion when we go into the ever deeper uh, neural networks and other complicated models. So is there really a solution to, to being able to try enough parameters to really explore the space? I guess it's still relatively okay when we talk about some discrete hyperparameters with a few choices each, then you can kind of fairly easily parallelize and try them all out. But I could easily see this exploding and getting out of hand. Any, any thoughts on this? I guess uh, some, some parts. Uh, so, I mean, the continuous uh, parameters might be a little bit easier to optimize since they are varying to some extent. The, these um, uh, like options that are discrete uh, and not really like a, on a continuous scale might be a little bit harder for the optimizers to find the uh, best uh, set of parameters. Um, so yeah, even though, uh, though there are few of them, uh, it might be more difficult since the, the jump between them is, uh, is not uh, so easy for an optimizer to, to solve. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, so then, uh, then uh, there was a question about the, the, all the parameters, right? Um, I think, yeah, there are quite a lot of information that we can get out of them. Um, even the, the parameters of the model themselves encode quite a lot of information uh, in the different layers as we have seen before. And we've also done some related work in, in, uh, in exploring which part of the model encodes which uh, different types of information. So I think uh, by exploring and uh, trying to understand, uh, we can we can at least get to some uh, general knowledge about how they behave. Uh, then the specific specifics of a particular model might be much more tricky. Uh, and yeah, the the explosion of uh, parameters is certainly requires uh, perhaps a, a little bit different approach than we've traditionally done in the visualization community, I would say. If I could add, uh, when we talk about hyperparameters, we include data sets as well. Does that mean that at some point in time, we would be able to cover the whole data space that data sets in general uh, would uh, yeah, cover? <laughs> I think yeah, uh, that is probably, I mean, if we could do that, then we probably would have solved a lot of problems. Uh, but perhaps for a type of uh, data, uh, in combination with a type of models, uh, having uh, like the, the whole space with any data, any type of model, uh, that will, I wouldn't say be impossible, but uh, extremely difficult. But uh, I mean, for, for a certain set of problems, I think we can dig out quite a lot of information. But wouldn't this be just as neural network architecture search? So you just optimize towards one metric and when you're fine, when you have to optimize for that? For that? Uh, well, if you put in data set there, then you have an infinite number of combinations. So uh, I think you need to have a, a certain type of data that uh, you're, if you're interested in. And I mean, in, in Nate, if you at least deal with the natural data, they, they don't span the infinite space of like all different parameter settings. So there is a valid range and usually it's normally distributed. Uh, uh, even with, with, our, with our work, when we train these 13,000 models, the, uh, 
the the mode of the uh, the different test accuracy is uh, usually normally distributed as well, uh, which is interesting. Um, and also that if you have, yeah, yeah I think that uh, that, that covers it. <laughs> I, I have a genuine question from the floor, so I think I can uh, help on my way to the front now. So it's from Douglas again. It's actually about the last presentation. Uh, he was asking whether the data set is available uh, and is it labeled or automatically or was it done manually? So uh, the data set is available, but uh, you need to pay for that. <laughs> So it's, uh, there is a paywall, unfortunately, and it's automatically labeled. So technically, we have the transcript, uh, what was said there, but uh, there is no uh, handmade labels for the phonemes. So we need to, need to align those data automatically. I hope that answers the question. Okay, I'm just typing that in. Yeah, good. I'm sure you can get in touch with you directly if you want to find some more details. Okay, uh, I've received a couple of messages that we're running a little bit short on time. If there's one short burning question, we can probably handle it. But after that, we might actually need to close MLVIS 2020, the virtual version. Well, I just make one comment in the sense that we've had quite a lot of people on the line. So we had more than 30 in the first session, nearly 30 currently here. So that is a good turnout um, from, from our point of view, from the organizers' point of view. So thank you for attending. Yes, thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you for submitting interesting papers. Just like I said, uh, we had a fair number of uh, interesting papers this time. And it looks like we will be concluding MLVIS 2020. Thank you very much for your attention. We hope to have a, a very good version of this uh, workshop in 2021. And we thank for everyone for participating uh in this workshop in 2020 and so with that uh virtual mlviz the fifth mlviz is uh, uh about to be closed thank you very much again for all your contributions and your attention thank you thank you for organizing thank you everyone thank you